everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Denny Miller, and welcome to Indy 500 Yesteryear and Today with Speedway Insiders Paul Page, Bob Gates, and we have a special guest today, uh, the legendary Merle Bittenhausen. Uh, Merle, thanks for being here. Uh, had it not been for technical issues, we would have had you on Monday on your dad's birthday, September 12th. So this is kind of a belated birthday to your dad. We're glad you're on our show. And maybe you know and didn't know that we always dedicate this show to Robin Miller. This Today, our last show of the season is taking place in Charlie Brown in the Robin Miller Corner. So, uh, couldn't be a better way to send off the uh, the show. So, uh, we're glad to have you, Merle. First of all, I got to say something. I, Susie has heard this story several times, uh, but I had an uncle Paul who lived in Chicago Heights. Paul Metzinger, and he knew your dad. And I used to pester my mom and pester her and pester her, please talk Uncle Paul and to invite Tony Bettenhausen down to our house for dinner. And in a child's mind, I really uh, <laughs> saw that happening. And I, I very much planned what we'd have from shrimp cocktail to T-bone steak. I was even going to set it you know, like they set the salad fork on top of the plate. I was even going to have them put a cigar on the top of that. <laughs> Just every, everything was was going to be perfect. And it never came about. But in my mind, from a child's mind, uh, probably my biggest idol was your dad. And, uh, and to make that happen was the thing. And then secondly, there used to be a hot dog company called uh, Marhofer and they would have uh, in the spring inside their hot dogs uh, a five by seven picture of a race car driver with a signature and its statistics on the back side and there was Eddie Sachs and Roger Ward and Johnny Thompson and Jimmy Bryan and I think one of the Rathmans and your dad and I wound up getting all of those, but your dad's wow. was the hardest one to get. And I would, and I'd have to keep eating. My mom would make me eat those hot dogs. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, if we had, and it was kind of like the baseball cards. You open it up, and you get another uh, Bill Scowron or something like that, who you didn't want or something. But I finally got uh, uh, a Tony Benton housing card, so I had all six. Bob or Paul, do you remember Marhofer Wieners and that promotion? Oh, 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 yeah. You know, speaking of food, I probably ought to tell you where we are, which is at Charlie Brown. And several times a month, a lot of racing people will meet here, a nice long table. And then we got this corner. Bob definitely sitting right next to me. I'm, I'm over here. <laughs> and that's a little corner dedicated to Robin. So yeah, you see Robin. Robin's picture there in the background. Uh, that's, uh, we could have had a more fitting way to, to conclude the season. And if, if our viewers would have seen the technical challenges of us trying to get on before we started, Robin would still be laughing how uh, Keystone Coffees we looked uh, getting started. But going back to the Marho for Wiener thing, uh, Paul, I'm just curious. You've tried those. How they compare to Nathan's hot dogs? Oscar Meyer is by far superior. Oh, okay. So uh, anyway, that was my thousand stories, and I and I told Susie that multiple times, but that that really. Uh, really was special. And my first race was in 60. And my cousin Bill, and my uncle Harold and I all picked the driver. Uh, Bill picked her to be the rookie. Uh, I picked your dad and then Uncle Harold picked Jim Rathman and win. Uh, it was I remember day. like yesterday. Yeah, and that was the day that he comes into the pits, the engine smoking, he climbs back uh, <laughs> 
above the seat and, and steers it in. I think the rear end went out and it was really hot down in, in the cockpit. So he sat up on the tail and kind of drove it down through gasoline or through the, the pit area with driving it with his feet because it was too hot for the rear end. Well, Merle, how we typically do this show, we kind of wrap up uh, uh, some of the highlights in racing and then look at our most recent race, which was the season finale at Laguna Seca. And then we will trans uh, transfer and chat with you about your dad and the parallelness of Will Power winning his second title and first and second title and your dad's two titles as well. So it's going to be a very interesting show. And again, this is kind of dedicated to Robin. We also uh, honor your dad's birthday as well. So, so the thing that stood out to me, which is kind of exciting, Jagger Jones will be in Indy Lights in 2023. And he's leapfrogging over one of the series to get there. And... Um, you know, you're going to have Cardinelli and PJ and uh, now Jagger Jones at the Speedway probably in 2024, which I think is great. And if that does happen, then he joins the Andrettis, the Vukovichs, and the Brabhams as three generations of drivers to race there. So that's kind of special. Uh, how do you think you will do in Indy Lights, uh, Bob? Uh, everything I've heard about Jack, he's very talented. And, uh, he's very talented and uh, has uh, has a lot of potential. So uh, he's been winning in whatever classes he's been running in. So I expect that to continue. I think Do he's they say he's more like his grandpa in talent or his dad in talent? That's a well, fair question to ask. Yeah. I, I've heard more like his granddad, but, mm -hmm. you know, that's the thing people say. You never know until he actually gets in the Indy car or gets in Indianapolis and we'll find out a little bit more about that. But I think it's exciting, too. It's always great to have those uh, names with the great legacy in, in Indy cars. Paul, what do you think about uh, Jagger coming? I, I, I kind of agree with Bob. Apparently, talking to a guy there who is uh, more like his grandfather, uh, certainly an attitude. And uh, the only thing you got to concern yourself with many guys have the skill to make that big jump. A lot of guys, not necessarily, but I think we're talking to Jones here. He's probably going to go in the tomorrow, maybe Formula One. <laughs> well, Merle, you know, and your family knows all about the, I guess, the pressures of following an icon uh, parent uh, and driving. And uh, Jagger will have that uh, too. What was it kind of like to uh, follow your, in the footsteps of your dad? I always said that uh, uh, when you are, when you are a son or in this case, grandson, it's always easier to get the door open to procure the ride and have to have an opportunity, but then your the, the critics really come out after you. You know, I remember Gary when he first drove in the Yankee 300 in his stock car in 1963, and I don't know finished 14th or whatever happened. They said, "Well, he's not his dad." I mean, that, that, that was the famous the famous things that came out. So, yeah, it helped you getting started, but then, the, like I say, the the critics were after you. So. But uh, it was a great opportunity. Yeah. You know, they say uh, his younger brother may even be more talented than Jagger, too. Uh, and it'll uh, be interesting to watch. We'll yeah. certainly be following your career. You know, Merle had not only the pressure of a father, but the pressure of a brother uh, that was uh, very talented and pretty outspoken, too, about the family's talents from time to time. Hey, Bob, uh, just, just a little sidebar. Uh, Gary was Gary was the son of Tony Bettenhausen, and then I was the brother of Gary Bettenhausen. <laughs> and then Tony came along, my kid brother, and I was I was Tony's older brother, 
then my son played basketball and I was Ryan's dad. Then, so. <laughs> I've never ever, never been, to ever been to Merle. Well, Susie told me, I don't know if she was pulling my leg or not, that Robin was considered her fourth brother. Very close. Very true. So uh, I know Robin and the Bettenhausens were almost adjoined at the. Now, before we change, I got to have you tell that extremely funny story about Robin driving uh, your the car that he purchased from you and didn't have a very good outing and what Gary said to him. This is hysterical. Now, is this an X-rated show or? Well, yeah, I guess so. CG so. or what? Yeah. Well, what happened was that Robin bought the car I drove and he went to Kokomo and he qualified pretty good and and Gary and a bunch of the racer buddies were down, were talking to him and, and Gary said, you know what? I think I think there might be a chance, Robin. You you, you look a lot better than I thought you were. So so it made Robin feel like a million bucks, right? So they went to IRB and uh, he had Bettenhausen on the hood of the car, and Robin and, and Tony qualified pretty bad. And afterwards, I I can remember Gary walking down and said some choice words for Robin and said, "Take my." He went, went from, from champ to chump, and Gary didn't want to be associated with him. <laughs> you know, Denny, um, this is a really special day. You mentioned his dad's birthday, but Merle was telling us that this is a special day for him, too. I'm sorry? This is, this is, this might be the happiest day of my life. 50 years ago today, September 16, 1972, I got out of the University of Michigan Hospital after a two-month stay after I crashed and lost my arm. Yeah. So I know, uh, as, as a Merle Bettenhausen fan, it was so cool to see you soon after get back in a midget and, and win and run up front. Uh, that was that was just fantastic to watch. It was a, a situation where I uh, no one had ever done it with a prosthesis, and, uh, and I, we did win the race in Johnson City end of end of uh, August in nineteen seventy three, and uh, I don't know if I ever had a happier day in my life other than when my children were born but uh, I tell the story that it's it's uh, it's like you know race car drivers need, tend to needle each other and you walk up to a guy and you say you know what I could beat your butt with one arm tied behind my back <laughs> and to go out and do it with, with not that arm even behind your back you just did it with one arm was a pretty 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 happy moment for me was was gary there that night that you won no gary was at, at uh, california they were running out there uh, not not in california. California. For the first yeah. yeah so uh, and uh, i remember somebody told him the next day and i heard he was pretty happy who who for, who'd you tell first your mom or gary uh, I think I told, I couldn't get hold of Gary, didn't know where he was staying, but it was my mom, I think. But it was, a, it was more personal, just doing a dream and, uh, and living it. And it, I, I tell everybody that it changed my life forever that night because I figured if I could do that with one arm, there wasn't anything in the world I couldn't do if I put my mind to it. Did, did you consider uh, running Indy? Would they have allowed you to run Indy in those days? What happened was when I came back driving, that was the long road, the long range goal of myself, of what I wanted to do. But uh, after racing, and I raised spring cars, and I raised silver pound cars, I realized that uh, some things you might dream about doing, but physically they weren't possible. So I, I never ever uh, got that far, and then 
of course, I quit, uh, you know, just a little after a year because when Gary got hurt up at Syracuse, I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. Had Gary not got hurt there, might you kept going? My, my goal, and this was 1974, was to win the USAC Midget Championship with one arm and retire at the banquet. That I, because I realized that I couldn't do any more than that without probably making a fool out of myself with one arm. And, and just for, for the news, I was second in the USAC Midget standings at that time, 43 points behind Mel Kenyon, and he went on and won the championship that year. But, you know, the old story, hip hands and butts were candy and nuts. He'd, he'd have Christmas every day. Well, I guarantee I'd have beat him. <laughs> I uh, maybe later you'll tell your uh, your famous story that Gary loves so much about you applying for a job at uh, Indianapolis the airport. At the airport. But we'll we'll continue on. Uh, uh, Max Verstappen won Monza when he's on his way to the second title. Uh, you see any F1 drivers? Doing a Grosjean or a uh, uh, Ericsson and coming to IndyCar next year. Paul? The only one I would wonder about is uh, Ricardo. And I'm not sure what his situation is now, but you know, the IndyCar has got a lot of good people in the seats right now. And, um, as we, if we're going to talk about Monza, I am going to say, man, that was. That was like the second worst finish I've ever seen out of them. The worst one was at the end of the season last year with their decision making. I don't know why when they had a stall car on the racetrack and they knew they were going to have to pick up with some sort of tow truck that they didn't either slow the pace car down or no red flag. But they did it. Well, no, notice Merle how we can we're talking about Monza, and we can segue to your dad and his success at Monza. Did, did yes, you, that was uh, quite a moment in 1957 when he set the world record of 177 mile an hour driving the Novi there, and and uh, the engine was more powerful in the car because after he ran about six or eight laps in the race, the shocks. Brackets all bent and broke, and, and uh, he ran so fast that the car fell apart. But I do have a, a wonderful, wonderful story about Monza. And uh, my dad told us when he got home. They, they, were, they had the pit area and then the paddock, and then you'd walk out through into the, into the fans to get to your parking lot. And he's, of course, he's got his uniform on. And he, him and my mom are walking out through there, and the guy comes up to me and goes, he looks at him, kind of squints, and goes, you bet the house? And my dad, I'm sorry? He said, you bet the house? And my dad, yeah, I'm, I'm betting the house. And he goes, you nuts! <laughs> and, and that was because he called by 177 mile an hour, and all the Jaguars over there were running up. 153, I think. So, so this guy said, "Bet the house, you nuts." <laughs> I heard or I read that it was so rough it shook your dad's uh, filling uh, or cap from his tooth or something. And everything. Well, at see what they when, when they made that crack, unlike they do now, the crack was laid top to bottom. So, so where, where the, it was concrete, and then, and then when, when the road was like, like driving over washboard, as opposed to being laid in the same direction that the cars are driving. So that was that was the problem. No one expected to go 170 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, also, willpower breaks Mario's. Uh, career pull record at the season finale. Uh, what do you think about that, Paul? That was a great, great moment. I, it was, you know, you look at the crowd around him, especially uh, when, when Mario comes up through the crowd. 
Uh, I would have liked to see him hop on the car and ride up the hill with him. But it was even, it was just so pointy and so emotional. I was, even the wheel said it was so emotional. So, uh, yeah, that was a super moment. What a gracious man, great champion. Mario continues to be. Oh, just a, yeah. himself, man. Now, I know, uh, I know Will Power is a black belt and really into that karate stuff. So, I got to be careful how I phrase this. But, uh, he may have the record, but what is glaringly missing is a pool at Indy. And whereas Mario has three, uh, you know, I I see something like what Ed Carpenter has done with three pools, or Scott Dixon with more than that, or Rick Mears with six, is, is much more prestigious than almost the pool record. What say you, Bob? Well, yeah, that's one thing Will hasn't done for pole positions. And, but I, I like what uh, Will said on camera. Then I heard him say the same thing to Mario. And, and that's the fact he admitted, you know, in Mario's day, it was much tougher uh, to get those poles. Some of those poles came on dirt tracks. Some of those poles came on places like Langhorne and, and tracks like that. So. Uh, I think uh, Will is, of course, happy to have that record, but it's also humbly acceptable with the realization, well, maybe I'm not quite Mario and Well, but it would be nice for him to win a poll. Uh, there's only a handful of drivers. Actually, there's quite a few that can claim that they won the pool position at Indy and the Indianapolis Five. Right. Uh, well, the thing with winning the poll, in, like in Mario's day, for instance, that was so prestigious that people are still remembered today for winning the pole position, although they never won the 500. I mean, you think about Rex Mays, mm -hmm. for instance, or you think about Jack McGrath, uh, never won the 500, but they're still remembered today, primarily because of their qualifying efforts at Indy. They had that much uh, prestige back then. I, I hate to say it, I'm not sure the pole position at Indy carries quite the prestige that it did back then. Mm -hmm. Back when, even when Mario and Foyt and some of those guys were running. Well, the storylines, even like when Walt Faulkner won his poll, uh, his throttle stuck. Right. <laughs> and uh, they were interviewing, this is just a few minutes before the final gun, they were interviewing Freddie Agabation for winning the poll. And, <laughs> yes, uh, right. and Faulkner knocks him off. Uh, right. Then Agabation, a couple years later, really had a historic run in the Cummings Diesel. And the tires were even chunking away. As that, that's a good platform. example. Uh, most people remember Freddie Agabation today and the Cummings Diesel. That was 1952. I can't do my math that quickly. Was that 70 years ago? Still remember that because mm -hmm. he won the pole position in Indianapolis. Think about that as a, you know, as a legacy. So uh, then, Benny, uh, Benny, a little side, sidebar to this is Mario never had teammates like Will Power did. I wonder how many times when Power was third or fourth, he had a Penske car that was first. And so the, the competition between their own team to be on the pole of Indy was some, something pretty, pretty intense, intense that, that, the, that the Power had to put up with. So. Yeah, uh, I'll bet you Penske's got 10 of them. Well, <laughs> even though he only got one of the 10. But, but another sidebar is, is uh, the fact that Power won his second championship. And I think it was eight years after the first, right? That's correct. And, yep. and my dad won, won his second championship seven years after his first. And and Powell won one race, and my and my dad in the second championship didn't win any races. So a little bit of a, it, I think it's called a little more common sense, and and not pure brutal strength and speed. I think even Power said he gave up many wins this year. To, he keeps scoring points everywhere. Now he uh, he was so admitted so in a press interview of that app. Merle, we're, we're going to get back uh, we're going to get back to that uh, 
two wins of your dad's. Uh, but we want to talk about uh, Alex Pelo dominating the race. And uh, how many times in IndyCar you see a 30-second win now? That was just uh, yeah, that was he was he an was sure exclamation point on that. He was, and like he said himself, he, he was in the zone uh, at that point. Just everything working well together between the driver and the car. And great timing on the pit stops, great pit stops. Yeah, that was a dominating, dominating performance. I don't, uh, I don't know if it had any influence, but uh, Palo is staying with, uh, with Ganassi. Yep. Um, apparently, he got a pretty good boost in uh, salary. Uh, that deal is all settled now and shut the court down. Palo will race with Ganassi next year, which helps Rosenquist out a great deal. I think you, I think Felix Rosenquist may very well uh, exceed his game next year. I think he's a very talented driver that can like very him. well win Indy. Uh, and. He, uh, his brand got a little tarnished with uh, when he left Ganassi to McLaren uh, and teaming with awards a tough, a tough uh, hurdle to climb over, but uh, it worked out. Uh, what do you think the real reason was? McLaren didn't want to pay that kind of severance pay? or there's probably a backstory to that. Are you hear anything, Paul? Well, I'm not it's more a guesstimate than anything else. Uh, I think probably Ganassi's legal case was a little stronger. Yeah. And so they had to kind of figure it out. I mean, Ganassi did have an established contract. And since uh, nobody had, had, had indicated that that contract was void in any way, McLaren didn't have a whole lot to stand on. Would be my guess. Yeah, and the money involved was that because uh, I had heard that Chip Ganassi wanted 10 million from from McLaren to let the blow go. So I think I, I agree with Paul. He had a strong legal case. He could demand anything he wanted at that point because legally he was in the right position. And uh, so uh, yeah, so is this kind of like ma is this a little like Major League Baseball when they get a All Star player uh, for the run for the pennant? Uh, is this just a second year and then uh, Below's gone to McLaren? Do you see that? The 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 glittery nugget is the F one uh, prize, and I'm sure. Uh, for a ward and now if Blow goes there, they can see themselves in the McLaren F1 seat. Uh, yeah. So uh, and, you, and see I, this, I'm not you, you see this is last the, year? To the contract, I'm not privy to the contract, but there very well could be a uh, clause in the contract like Colton Herta has with his Andretti contract that gives him an out if he gets the Formula One opportunity. That could have been part of the settlement. I don't know that. Sure. Good segue, Robert, because that's <laughs> another topic we want to discuss and what's happening uh, potentially with Red Bull and Herda and Super License and everything like that. Well, I do I do like a couple of people's opinions saying that's that Super License is nonsense with someone as good as Herda with that kind of success in IndyCar. Here's, here's my guess on that. Um, the super license is a serious problem. So not going to get the point, and uh, that was a problem for them. And the fact that we have an hour one week later than the end of the IndyCar season, that's some big announcement that uh, Golden is going somewhere else. I believe he's going to stay right where he is and stay in IndyCar for at least another year. Well, that's good. And then you, you, you've had this assignment all along this season. That you let him do like Mario on every deal that he can still run into. Put that in his contract. Not a problem now. Okay, all right. So we can check that off our uh, how about Joseph Newgarden starting last and moving up to finish second uh, uh, on that spirited run? Uh, you, you couldn't probably ask for a, a better 
way to try to win his third title than what he did. He, right. he, uh, but it was all academic with power getting third anyway. But it was, it was great. It was great television theater. Uh, you ever see too many more runs quite that good? I think Guerrero so. one time started last. Yeah, one Mike, Mike Mosley. Mosley. Yeah, uh, it, it was an incredible run. Is what really strikes me about this run. And, but really, uh, New Garden's attitude this year has seemed to be much more aggressive to me than he'd ever been in the past. He always came across the kind of way back and mm -hmm. really yeah. like a nice guy, which, which he is. But he just would, uh, you know, when he crashed in qualifying, he refused to get out of the car. So the safety crew ended up moving him back with, with uh, him still in the car because he wanted the, every opportunity to try to get back out there and put some more laps in. And that's an aggression that I've seen from New Garden and I really haven't seen in the past. Mm -hmm. And a, a little testy at times uh, right. uh, on interviews too. Yeah. I mean, in a way, that's, as a television person, Paul, you'd have to love that versus this more vanilla ice cream. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Any, anytime there's there's some heat in there, I'm happy. That makes a good show for me. You know, I I also think that the classic picture of this entire season, and maybe a bunch of seasons, was in the practice when he had his nose holding up the whole car. I guess you call it some form of high centering. But when he caught up like that, I thought, oh my goodness, that's that's uh, that's a great picture. And then we've been following this story all season long too. I think it was fantastic uh, to follow. It was Kristen Lungard did win Rookie of the Year over David Malukas, and what two talented young drivers they have in IndyCar with the two of those. And, right. Uh, Lungard really outshone both Ray Hall and certainly Jack Harvey. In fact, he had to put a bunch of heat under uh, Jack Harvey's seat with the way he ran this year compared to what Harvey did. And I, I, I don't know how pleased Hyve was over that when they saw Lungard's uh, performance. Uh, Malukas uh, stays, I guess, now since uh, Pelo stays. Yep. And they're now saying this very talented Linus Lundquist might be a third car for Dale Coyne. Uh, and he's quite talented. So he's not saying, I guess, Linus, or it's Linus. Yeah, they, well, they I, can't, we can't forget I want as well. Oh, no. Yeah, that was next. See, all right, I'm going to ask both of you, rank first, second, and third, uh, Lungard, uh, Malukas, and Ilot. That's a good question. Yeah, I, I don't really have the answer to that, but... Uh, I think in some sense, uh, I would go with Malukas. Uh, just simply, he, he would have finished better but he had some bad luck doing several races this year. Some of his own making, some not. Um, where he might have bit, beat Christian, you know, for that rookie of the year title. Christian was more consistent. No. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure if that says anything about his driving style, or to be quite honest, uh, the Ray Hall team. You know, they haven't been top of their game this year, so... Uh, you know, it's a little, if he's running a little bit easier than the competition, it's a little easier to be consistent as well. For our viewers who did not see this, uh, Ilot qualifies on the outside of the front row for the season finale and just, just barely misses getting the pull oh. from Will Power. Right. So I think all three of those drivers at yeah. one time or the other started on the front row. And I think, uh, I think next year, we're going to be surprised by uh, uh, the new Andretti driver, whose name just slipped my mind. <laughs> Kyle Kirkwood? Kyle Kirkwood. Yeah. I think he's going to surprise some people next year. Well, he uh, by far was considered the most 
the best of all the rookies right. before the season started. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, he, Portwood didn't have the best of seasons, but I think more of a reflection, unfortunately, of the AJ 14. Yeah, well, but I mean, uh, some people mm -hmm. next year. look at uh, Ilot driving for that small team, you know, and he, they outperformed the Foyt team, which shouldn't have happened. Uh, so, uh, so what do you think about the other rookie? Uh, I know he's coming back next year, uh, D. Francesco. By the way, he's five four. I checked that out. Yeah, yeah. He's a tiny little guy, and he's put he puts some great shows from time to time. I mean, he's really, really showing that he has the skill. He just doesn't have the consistency just yet. Um, but you know, the one thing though is. Everything we're talking about just shows you how good the future of IndyCar is in general. You got all these like, incredible drivers coming up, and, and it, it just talks about how good that series really is. Not that I'm prejudiced, of course. <laughs> well, for those who did not see it, here is the breakdown of Will Power winning his championship. He has the title of 560 points. Newgarden finished second with 544. Scott Dixon third at 521. Uh, Scott McLaughlin and Alex Blow tied at 510. And Erickson slid down to 506. So Ward seventh at 480. Rosenquist eighth at 393. Rossi uh, ninth at 381. And Herta also at 381. And Herta just had a bunch of issues, or he might have been the champion this year. Yeah. Um, New Garden had five wins, McLaughlin three wins, Dixon Award two wins each, and uh, Power breaks the record, and he wins the title since uh, 2014 to 222, and that segues in to our guest, whose dad won uh, the 1951 driving championship, in a, a bit of an unusual way, Lee Wallard won the 1951 Indy 500 Dominator. Well, led over 150 laps in the Belanger car, the 99 car, which was probably one of the prettiest cars, paint jobs ever. And then in victory lane, Wallard said he's going to be the winningest driver ever. And four days later at Reading, he was critically burned. Uh, in a sprint car accident there, and then your dad takes over and wins eight races and finishes second twice. So uh, tell us about that season. Merle, uh, that was 51. Can you remember it at all? I can, I can remember being at Springfield in the coin, uh, and I remember victory lane at Springfield. Gary and I were in our dad's lap, and, uh, and we still were pretty special. But, uh, you know, my, my dad, dad is driven for Ballinger, and, and it was going to be his car after the 500, but he thought the car was too light to run the 500. And so he he actually suggested getting Lee Wallen to drive the car. But... Uh, then, then, you know, the spring car accident and getting burned at Reading. But uh, it, it, was, uh, it was pretty special. It's funny because my dad bought the family farm from his mom and uh, was being remodeled. And, and he'd come home and say, I got some more money for the farm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, bro, tell, tell us about your farm growing up, how big was it? And uh, I know you boys had to do chores and everything too. Uh, you didn't get out of that too easily, right? This farm was built in 1894 and uh, by my grandpa. And my dad grew up on this, on this place. He was the youngest of eight kids. And uh, when he was 18 months old, his dad was out picking corn with a horse and wagon. The horse reared up, kicked, kicked his dad in the stomach, and he died of a ruptured appendix about a week later. 
And so my dad never had a connection with his father. And he grew up being the youngest, being the spoiled, and, uh, and didn't like to take orders from anybody. And the last thing he liked was walking in the barn looking at horses because he'd look at a horse and he'd say, you, you took my dad from me. So he really got involved in the automobile back then, would read about it. Actually, the word was that he took his, his engine out of his mother's car, took it apart, and it ran better after he put it back together at about age 14 or 15. I don't know if that's a true story. But it sounds good. So, uh, <laughs> so what, what heard about? Did you grow and raise corn food? or or beans huh? or would you raise corn or beans or livestock or a combination or? Well, I had a combination of cows, pigs, and uh, and, and corn and soybeans. The farm was two hundred and forty acres, I believe. And uh, my grandma used to say that. Her daughter could outwork any four men if they brought them over. So, uh, because my grandma's, my, my grandpa died at 44, I think. So she was about 40 with all this farming. And had, my dad had two brothers, but the, the girls were mostly the farm ladies that did all the work and, uh, and were involved with these horses, which my dad had nothing to do with. He didn't like horses. I remember when I was a kid, he'd say, horses went out with high button shoes. And then that was partially because, you know, he never knew his dad because of the, the accident with his dad. When did the uh, Bettenhausen uh, car dealership start? And what, what brands of cars did your dad sell? Well, we, we lived in Tinley Park during the war. And after the war, my dad got a Kaiser Fraser dealership in Blue Island, Illinois, which is about 15 miles from Tinley Park, where we live. And he had that dealership from 1946 to 1950. And Kaiser had a, had a, had a great design car, but bad engines. And they basically went out, out of business building cars and my dad got hooked up with Chrysler and the dealership that he got in Tinley Park then in 1951 was a, was a Kaiser, uh, excuse me, a Chrysler Plymouth dealership. So that's when he was, when he sold uh, Chrysler Plymouth and then he got involved with his brother and brother-in-law and they had a John Deere implement store kind of kitty corner across the street. So uh, that, that's where we were. But, let me do a little bit about the farm. Uh, my dad left the farm, farm racing, racing, and my, my uncle lived on the farm. farm. And they had a barn that burned down in 1948, and so he couldn't farm it. So the, the farm actually sat vacant from 48 to 1950. And uh, my dad would always wanted to move back out there, but he didn't think he was married to a city girl, and, and my mom wanted to lived there and finally she said I think it was the beginning of 1950 Tony, Tony why don't we buy the farm and so that, that started us and she became a farm girl and we, we, we got to be modeled and moved out there uh, I think it was November 1951 after my dad kept getting some money to buy it <laughs> but uh, yeah he had the Chrysler Plymouth store and uh Actually, the story is still going now with my second cousin operating it. It's the biggest Dodge Jeep uh, Ram store in Chicago area right now. In the, in the, in the car. What, what was more lucrative for your dad, the car dealership, farming, or racing as far as income? Uh, right, you know how racing goes. It's an elevator. You know, some years the elevator works well, works well, and some years it doesn't. And uh, he had some great years racing, yeah, but uh, the money he made racing we put into the into farming, and uh, and we did, did that. And this is uh, 
actually kind of a cute story. My my dad was in partnership with his brother-in-law and his brother. Now my dad had been pretty well around the world racing and was a, a go-getter, so to speak. And I remember he'd come home from they'd have a meeting with his brother and brother-in-law, and he goes, "Damn!" He said they're squeezing the nickels and missing all the. Five dollar bills flying by, and so they were partners for about six years. And they said we, we can't do that anymore. He had it, so they liquidated the business. That was 1956, and that's how we actually started literally farming. And uh, we had a 60 acre farm, but we cash rented and share crop a total of 560 acres by 1961. When he was when he was killed at Speedway, so so yeah, we were full fledged farmers, and uh, I think he used the, he used the farming as more of a tax deduction for the money he made racing. Say, Merle, mentioning automobiles, is that true? The story that uh, at age sixteen or something, you and Gary would get a, a new automobile. As a birthday present. Well, and, and if, that, if that indeed is true, what happened to your automobile? There's a there's a, a little bit of beginning to that. <laughs> when we were, let's see, 1951, my dad had us working on the farm, so I was I was uh, eight, Gary was ten, and every day before school. And after school, we take our clothes off and we'd, we'd be doing something for our dad. So, and, and, and the thing was, he said, you guys work your butts off and I'll get you a new car when you, when you turn 16. Well, it just so happened that my birthday was in June. Gary was in November. The Indy 500 was in May. So when do you think my dad had the most money? <laughs> June. So when, when I turned 16, Gary and I both got new 1959 Chevys. And I'll never forget it. I got a white one, and the window sticker was $2,810. Gary got an automatic transmission and a four barrel carburetor, and his was $3,198. So, so those, that was the two cars we got. I drove mine until 1962. And it was stock. Gary had everything in that car but a but a jet engine. He, he had three deuces. He, he made a race car out of it. But that that's the first the car we got. But Gary got a new car on my 16th birthday. <laughs> so hey Merle, what happened to your car? My car traded and I got a 62. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I drove it on. Uh, All right. Well, 1962. Uh, so, uh, then I got a new car and got it stolen at the amphitheater. Indoor drag racing. <laughs> well, your dad was a rookie at Indy in 1946. Uh, the yeah. Speedway had been shut down uh, in December of 41 when Pearl Harbor occurred. Uh, nothing happened over those years. Uh, Rickenbacker the owner was now more heavily involved in uh, owning Eastern Airlines, and he really didn't want the Speedway. Very easily, had not been for Eddie Rickenbacker being a race car driver, he would have sold it to land developers, and there would be no Speedway today. Wilbur Shaw really kind of helped save the day with Rickenbacker's blessing to go try to find a buyer. And Tony Hallman did buy it in November of 45. So you get all this crop of new rookies. I think there were 16 of them in 1946. And your dad was one of those. But my question is, and I know your dad won like the midget championship at, uh, at the Soldier Field in 41 and in 42. Uh, had there not been the war, when do you see him uh, first driving at Indy? Would it have been before 46 or? Oh, yeah. He was, he was there snooping around in 
41 or 42, but uh, we, we, you know, he won a, a champ race that Syracuse or Goshen or somewhere. So, so he had some experience in, in quote unquote the big cars back then. Yeah, and and I know that he was just so upset during World War II. Uh, he was working at the Buick plant in Chicago building engines for airplanes. And uh, that's how he didn't go in the service. But uh, my mom talked about how how he was he was an ugly individual because of doing that and, and he had taken racing away from him. So but I do remember 1946. My first year at the Speedway was 1949, when the only only year he missed the show. So, so I was just before my sixth birthday. But I remember we sat up in the penthouse and watched him qualify and miss the show. I can still see him coming by here about 13 mile an hour. <laughs> yeah, what happened on that? I, I that gap of 49. What what caused him to miss that year? Was it? The, the automobile went, he was driving. I'll give you a Bill, Book, a Bill Bukovich answer. He went too slow. <laughs> <laughs> no, but your dad is not re- one to I go too remember, slow. But, you know, huh? your dad was not one to go too slow. So, what, well, what caused we can blame, blame the car then. Let's blame the car. Okay. There's no backstory of that that uh, not that, that you're aware it is, of. I don't remember. You know, the Speedway was was a what would I, how would I call it? A nightmare for him. I think he raced it from 46 to 51 for 13 years. I finished, I think he finished three or four races, and most of it was mechanical. A couple of times he spun out, but the races he finished between second and 55, fourth and 59, fourth and 58, and, uh, and I don't know that he. Finished any other? I know he drove. He, he co drive with Joey Chitworth in 1951 and, right. and, and finished fifth, I believe. But uh, he just it, it, he always said, "Tear it up and make it dirt." <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in '51, there for a bit, right as the race was over, your dad yeah, was credited was. for second place. Yes, absolutely right. And. Uh, was that- was that 50 or 51? 51. 51, okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, he was second, and then they changed it to fifth. So, uh, well, Merle mentioned earlier about Tony not, didn't think the Ballinger car was strong enough to go the full 500 miles. And he was almost right because when Lou Waller finished that race, one or two of the shock absorbers were broken. I think uh, uh, the brake line was came loose. He didn't have any or very little brake. So the car was falling apart. So Tony wasn't too far off in his assessment. <laughs> yeah, he, he, was, he was right. If it had been a 600 mile race, he'd been really right. <laughs> the, uh, the thing that I've been told that in 1947, your dad was to drive one of the Blue Crown cars as a teammate to Maury Rose, which is the one that Bill Holland wound up driving and should have won had Holland ignored the easy sign that uh, Rose did not ignore. uh, And Holland gets second and Maury Rose wins uh, his second Indy 500. that was the year that they had that Aspar strike. And your dad, even though he was, that was just second year at Indy, was heavily involved in that, uh, uh, leaving a band of drivers. A lot of the Chicago drivers were involved in that. Did that, did that union involvement really cost him the Blue Crown ride? He got fired from the Blue Crown ride because uh, what's his name didn't want any politics. And Lou Moore. Lou Moore. Didn't want to be, he wasn't getting in politics, politics with the speedway. It was a pretty good, pretty good place for him. He didn't want to make any enemies. <laughs> That's funny because Lou Moore uh, kind of bucked the trend when they decided they weren't going to have the 42 Indy 500, and he wanted to create a, a race of 500 miles over Memorial Day so they would have a payday or something. So, uh, 
But yeah, can you imagine your dad being in the car with Bill Hall? And and here, better yet, knowing your dad, they hold up an easy sign to him. <laughs> what, what 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 would have happened uh, if Rose uh, was sneaking up on him or something like that? Well, it, it, it's hard to say, you know, looking back, but uh, I, he, he, I don't know if he ever paid attention to the word easy. <laughs> it wasn't his vocabulary or brain. <laughs> So uh, that uh, he did he eventually did drive for uh, Lou Moore and the Blue Ground, but they then were not yeah. the powerhouse cars that they they once were back in 47, 48, and 49. They were on the downside of the mountain. Yeah. But that, that happened the same way with your dad with J.C. Agajanian as well. Uh, that wasn't the... Uh, I'm not saying my dad was a genius at the speedway. <laughs> he, he was a year behind everybody. Like, what do you want to do in 1952? Drive the 99 car. And what do you do? He crashed it. So then, then Rutman wins in 53 or 52, and my dad wants to drive to that car the next year. <laughs> so it, uh, he, uh, he was his worst enemy sometimes. And he wasn't too bullheaded. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where who, Gary got it? Who, yeah. who was who was more headstrong? Your dad or Gary or Susan? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. And, and I'll throw yes. your sister in yes. on that too. I, I, I thought three yeses there. So, uh, I'm the only one that had any kind of common sense and I tear my arm off. What does that mean? You know, if you put a helmet on all of you uh, siblings so you everything else is obscured Susie looks the most like your dad of the four well, and, I don't want to say I, Susie looks like a guy but uh, she has the resemblance of your dad more than Gary and certainly you and Tony you take more after your mom I would say I think so yeah and, uh, yeah, I, and I really believe that if Suze would have been a man, she'd have been as good as Gary. Because they, boy, talk about oil and water. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I was, I had a striped shirt on being a referee most of my life, keeping those two from scratching each other's eyes out. So... But anyway, uh, you know, I, I got, I got to, I'm going to say something here. Uh, Susan and I have talked over the years, and uh, my dad was such a disciplinary. I, I mean, it's hard to believe how much he was, hit and how much he yelled at us kids for doing it right. And uh, not so much Susan, but. Everything we did, he said, I said, do it right or don't do it at all. And, and it was hard for us to understand how he could be so mean to us. And that this is Gary and I talking about. Well, Susan and I, we started talking a couple years ago. And you, if you think back to the 50s, if you were a race driver and you lived to be 35, you were an old man. <laughs> Because that's why we had so many new great drivers at Indy back in those days. Because we we lose four or five a year that we get killed because of you know spring car racing, midget racing, even Indy car racing. And all at once it dawned on us that, that here's my dad. He's got four kids, and he's 30, 30 35. And I think he gave us a crash course in, in growing up because he, in the back of his mind, it was always going to be, I'm not going to be here when they're 20, 30 years old. I could be gone. So I've got to put more emphasis on doing it right now if I'm going to get my point across to them and teach them what I think they should know. And... Uh, 
I mean, the more we talked about this, the more we realized that he knew maybe his time was limited and he had to he had to teach it fast, quick, and it wasn't pretty. But you know what? I think of him every day. So do you think he had he said, a, did, do you think Merle he had a premonition he wouldn't survive? Well, put it this way. How many people I'd like Bob to probably find out how many people lived to be 40 years old racing in 1959, 60? Not very many. Not very many. In fact, the 1955 Indianapolis 500 field where your dad sat on the middle of the front row, a third of that field died racing. And I think the last one of that group to die was your dad in 1961. So that wasn't very long. You know, but we never see. We never realize that your dad's not going to get killed in a race. Just like if uh, a race driver says, we we talked about this last week, racing without wall bars or cages, and we knew it was dangerous. We knew if a guy got upside down. This is my racing when I started in 1967. But you always thought it would be somebody else. Never, never. You believed in yourself that you would survive but it didn't always happen that way so but that was that was way before that they had six inch tires and no roll bar and uh you know five six a year we lose so so he was just teaching us i don't think he ever had a premonition i think that he, he figured he was gonna do it forever i mean 44 i mean and, uh, and I don't know if you looked his record up, Bob, but the last, the last four races in, in 1960, I think everyone was in the top five. Right. Yeah. Champ cars, midgets, one turkey night. I mean, he was the youngest, I mean, 44-year-old that, that ever lived. In. And I think he got the point that maybe I'm going to be one of those right. second guys that's going to be able to retire. But you know what? It didn't happen, but boy, did he leave a lasting impression. Well, okay. you, the, lucky the, man alive. the template was Sam Hanks just a couple years before that. Sam was yeah, a similar right. age and then wins Indy and retires. So I'm sure that may have uh, been on your dad's mind as well. Uh, I got to go back to uh, 55 when your dad finished second. Uh, that October of 54, your dad was, in some accounts, critically injured at Soldier Field in Chicago uh, with a concussion. Uh, and we'll talk about that injury. But because of that injury that he had, do you think that's what caused the agreement to have Paul Russo uh, share his ride in 55? Nothing at all to do with that. He was trying to be smart. Like I say, he, he, made, he made a lot of decisions and probably more of them were wrong. But uh, when did Dr. Scarborough die? What year? Uh, 53. 53? Yeah. 53. And... And, it, and obviously it was a tough 500 miles back in the day if it was 90 degrees. So he just thought, you got to remember Paul and him were like brothers. And he just thought that Paul could run the middle stage and they would be smarter than everybody, be fresher than everybody. My dad could finish the race and win it. So uh, it was pre-planned, nothing to do with anything. Other than my dad, and, over engineering, which he did a lot of. Well, I think, and, and that was the thinking among many car owners and drivers during those few years there. It's better. One car owner, it might have been than your dad's, said he'd rather have a fresh Russo than a tired Benton house. Yeah. And uh, so that was kind of the thinking of those days, too. See, and, and just a little bit about Paul for some people. People don't realize how close Paul was. Uh, my dad worked for the Champion Highway Safety Program in 59 and 60. 
and he was on the road a lot, and, and we were putting a corn dryer in with a big elevator and different things. So Paul came up and stayed with us December, January, February, March of 1960, leading up to my dad and then in the 61 500. So he, he was like a second dad to us. It wasn't, he must, just wasn't another race driver, my dad. I mean, they were truly, you know, they, they loved each other. So uh, that leads to people say, how, why would you get in this car and drive it in 1961? Well, because that was how much he cared for him and wanted to help him. So it was his true brother. The uh, he, but had your dad stayed in that car, didn't didn't Russo lose spots in the race from when your dad? Uh, oh yeah, oh that's terrible. So it, it could very, you could very well build the case he would have beat Bob Swigert that day. Would you absolutely. say, Merle? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they had terrible pit stops too. Uh, they had. I think it's funny, in uh, 1958, when he ran fourth and he drank the Jones and Maley car, and I don't know how accurate this is, but the story was that he was 88 seconds behind Brian, and he spent 88 seconds more in the pits. <laughs> so it was, uh, I mean, it would, it would take a minute to put change tires and put fuel in it. Guys were suit and ties on with filling the car up. I, uh, so, yeah. I thought your dad was very strong in 1959. And then on the uh, first day of time trials, he uh, gets upside down on the morning warm ups and then has to uh, go to a, a different car, in which he finishes fourth as well. But that that car, I don't think, was near as good as the one that he crashed. No. He, he, was, he was driving uh, the Anstead rotary car. Wind caught him on Saturday morning, grazed the outside wall, and then went across and hit the They just had wooden guardrail in the infield, and it, it flipped there. And, uh, the, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure this, my dad was up, upside down 27 times. 28. 28. 28. But that was the first time we ever got a champer upside down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've all those flips all those years. Yeah. And uh, and then uh, then he got into Hoover Motor Express car, and it was it was a car. It wasn't it wasn't what we didn't have Sonny Meyer as a mechanic, and, and uh, you know, and, and that, that was the car they had year before, before that the Jones Bailey car. car so. So. But. Uh, he, just, he, was he was always, always there. there. He just, he just not, many, not many times was was he the fast, the uh, fastest car. You, know, you can run you third, can run third and, and beat 120 laps. Well, oh, my, my dad. And now this is a, was a very monumental moment in 1958 uh, when my dad came by and and was leading the Indy 500. My mom started crying like a baby. We're sitting in Tower Terrace. And that was the first year, first time my dad, in all his running at the Speedway, had ever led the Indy 500. And I'll, I'll never forget looking over at my mom and the tears are rolling down her cheeks. So it's uh, quite a place, that 500. Paul, what do you remember, your memories of Tony Bettenhausen? Well, of course, I, you know, my whole my whole understanding of the Indy 500, my first awareness of the Indy 500 came in uh, 1960. Um, so right then, I, I, he was one of the guys I thought was very, very good. And then the next year, you know, he's gone. So I, but I liked him. I, I thought he had a lot of, um, a lot of bigger, he, had a, he was, um, he was bigger than life, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely he was. Uh, 61. No, well, let's go back to 60 when Herbie shocked everyone by running that 149 plus 
speed. 129.056. And, and so then, then in uh, uh, the next year, everyone was looking forward to that. And everyone was, your dad was the odds on pick to be that person to break that, that speed. Uh, um, I know you, if what I've read and Susie has said, uh, you were going to be going down there to see that historic moment. Merle, are you comfortable telling about uh, uh, that day in May? Yeah, uh, we always went, my dad and my mom went down to the Indy. That was when the track opened the first of May. They went down. My dad had just become a Shriner. And I'll never forget the last time I saw my dad, they drove away in their 59 Cadillac. Uh, and my dad had his Shriner cap on. And that was the last time I saw him. They went down and then my mom came home. And we were always planning to go down go down after school was out. I was, I was a senior in high school. Suze was a junior. Gary was working on the farm. Tony was just in grade school. And, uh, and so all week long, he was the fastest car, the fastest car. And, and, and just something crazy happened. I was, I was in a drafting class. And this was Friday. It was a morning class, I think 10 o'clock. And, uh, and I'm talking to a guy. And there was, a, and I couldn't tell you his name, or, but he sat behind me. And he was a smart aleck, right? So, we're, and I'm saying, yeah, we're leaving here about four o'clock going on. My dad was fast as car went 149. So just, just being senior, both guys carrying on a conversation. And this kid walks in, he goes, what's the guys BSing about? And I said, oh, I just want my dad. And we're going down to 500. And he goes, he looks at me, he goes, oh, your old man's going to get killed. Wow. I was dead, but I mean, it's just, I was the craziest thing. So, so we just, you know, went on with Friday afternoon and, and then uh, about two o'clock or whatever, I was in swimming class and I was wanted at the, at the office and, uh, and I, and I was so happy and, and then a the teacher came out and said, Merle, you're real, you're wanted at the office. And that teacher never talked to me. I know it was a pretty good walk back to the office. And, and I turned the corner and I saw my cousin was there. And uh, things started adding up and he said that my dad died. So, but uh, yeah, it, uh, it, uh, not something you should go through. Uh -huh. He very well could have dominated that race, like uh, that's the old if ands and buts kind of thing. But, but you know, this goes back to the August tire test when he was there. That was supposed to be Carnelli's car. My dad drove it. It was the Braun plywood car, and my dad drove it. And and I don't know what happened at the test. I remember my dad got home and he had a smile on his face and he said, after all these years, I finally figured out how to run the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And then we said, what do you mean, Dad? Well, I just completely drive down and kind of dime in the corner off. And he was so in love with that car. And then we said, they better look out for my butt next year. So uh, but that was... Uh, so then everything went just exactly the way it was supposed to be. Were you surprised that he did not uh, top the 150 mile an hour in practice? No, I mean, I mean, 49.7 with traffic, I guess it was pretty good. Yeah. But uh, I, I mean, I'm in school. He's he's driving down here. I, I can't. I don't. Know. Of course, we, of course, we wanted to. Yeah, wanted, wanted to be first, but uh, not surprised that he hadn't at that time. Oh. No one else was even close to him. No, no. Within no. two, three mile an hour of him. No. So that that was good enough. Well, well, Bob wrote the book on Bill Vukovich. 
Uh, I like the your dad knew Vukovic fairly well. Uh, oh, very well. And what kind of needling and kidding? I hear that story about the nails and Vuki Jr. True that story. True story. True Share that absolutely. with our viewers. Yeah, that is a, absolutely well. Vukovic was a good needler, and we lived in Sydney Park, which was right on the way to Milwaukee. And uh, one year, Vukovic was one of the guys who would stop by and spend the afternoon or whatever. And and Vukovic, you know, my dad's ragging up his boys, and Vukovic says, eh, my kid eats nails for breakfast. So that's fine and dandy. So the next year he comes by, and he stops, and I thought, we had a we had a garage full of bends with nails and bolts and screws. I went out there and I got about six of nails about five inches long. And I walked in. They were drinking coffee at the table. And I said, and I laid them on the table in front of Vukovic and said, here, have me these. I want to see that. <laughs> and my dad, I thought it, it was gonna fall out of the chair. <laughs> So that is a, I know that's true because I did it. Well, uh, what, what kind of question do you want to ask Merle about uh, his dad, Bob? I really don't have any. Because <laughs> him and I have talked so much, uh, you know, about uh, his dad and, and uh, many other uh, drivers of that era. So, I can't, I can't think anything off the top of my head, to be honest. Okay, well, well, Merle, did you have a good time on this show today? Do I have to be truthful? No, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> of course I did. Well, well I good, enough, good enough you will come back and tell more Bettenhausen brother stories or something in the future? Well, I, I can do anything. You know, I, I represented the Tony Bettenhausen's son's book. And I stood up in front of many people and I stood there and I said, now when you look at me, I don't want you to see me. I want you to see my dad over here, Gary over here, and Tony over here. I'm the only last man standing representing the family. There's nothing but Merle in this story. This is about my family. No. Uh, I am. Uh, if, if I, I can, can this is going to be a little awkward since you're sitting right here. But the way you handled your engine, which was horrible. The combination of the burn, the loss of the arm, it's pretty inspirational. I mean, think of all the other ways you could have gone, but you just persevered. You had your passion in racing, you had your passion in life, and you just stayed with it. And I've admired that that entire period of time. You're a hell of a man. Thank you, Paul. And that's, that's the end of that. I'm never going to say that again. <laughs> I, One and only time. <laughs> I, I, I just want to, I want to close with this. I, I'm going, now my dad died 60, what, 62 years, 61 years ago. And, and I'm sure he's sitting up there having he's going, you know, everybody complained about the way I raised my kids. I think I did pretty good. <laughs> they kept me alive for 61 years. So I say I, I was a pretty successful father the way I raised them. Now, isn't there isn't there a Bettenhausen girl that's pretty talented as a race car driver now? No. What's was, that? She, a... she, started, she started in kitty carts and she won, won with a lot of luck a couple races, which was great. But she's really a gymnastic, uh, and uh, she, she never, never got, got to the point in driving a go kart race car where mm -hmm. you take it to the edge. She she was just putzing along in you know three or four other kitty carts. So she uh, so my son said, if "You're not going to drive it. You're not going to you're not going to race it. You're not going to drive it." So so. <laughs> And she had to move up to a bigger car so he didn't do it. But I will tell you this quickly, quick story, a little sidebar. 
She's eight years old. Last year, she's a gymnastic. And uh, she's in the gold series. There's gold, uh, uh, silver, gold, platinum. She's in the silver, which is which means she hasn't been doing it as long as everybody else. Well, make a long story short, they had the state championship north of Chicago, and she was a state champion in the silver category. So that's only a little Illinois, you know, state of Illinois. So <laughs> she she took that racing passion and, and made it for gymnastics. So, Fantastic. So pretty, pretty proud. And then I got a, his, his son, who's six, is won, won some golf championships too, so. So, yeah, I got lots of stuff going on. And I got, and I got my daughter's got daughters going to school and college. And so uh, I, I know this is running, time. Merle, I know this is running along, but I, I you would, you, would you, would you tell, would you tell that favorite joke hey, story that to, Gary loved on, the dude. best? About I'm going to I'm gonna have to log off because I got to get to Brownsburg. Okay. So, okay. I'll say my goodbyes. It's All a great right. story. I've heard I've heard Merle tell it many times. Yeah. And it's a great story. So, well, before okay. you go then, Bob, any final comments on your end uh, for this, our season one? It's been, uh, been a lot of fun. And uh, I'm looking forward to the IndyCar season next year with all the intrigue from this year. Uh, it's been... Uh, going to be interesting with all the changes you know how's Rossi going to do a McLaren how's Kirkwood going to do how's uh, Rosenquist going to do by staying at McLaren so a lot of interesting things uh, are going to be happening next year well thanks for there's making a guy named special Rossi year. joining them too huh? there's a guy named Rossi <laughs> joining that team too that's right so Merle I'll let you tell this story then Paul I'll let you give your Final thoughts, and I will wrap up. Uh, but I love this story. In 1995, I was living in Wisconsin. I, I decided to move back to Indiana. Had an interview with Ray Stillman, got big dealerships here in town, and, and he hired me. So I moved down a couple of days before April 1st, 1995. And a guy said they have uh, a job opening out at the airport someone to run their parking lot. And I thought, well, I got the job with Ray, but I've always thought that job interviews are very, very knowledgeable, very powerful, and you learn a lot because they put you under the pressure of answering questions that you're not familiar with. So I gathered up my resume and ran out to the airport and knocked on about 10 different doors and I finally came across the airport manager. And I opened the, knocked on the door and he said, come on in. I opened the door and he goes, you're hired. And I said, <laughs> I said, hired. I said, you haven't asked me a question. You haven't seen my resume. I'm, what do you mean I'm hired? He said, I want you because no one can do the job like you. And I'm going, what? Wait, wait, wait a minute. What? Explain to me what the job is. He said, well, you stand at the entrance to the parking lot. Cars turn the corner. When they come down, and just as they get to you, you go long term parking or short term parking. <laughs> and I heard Gary thought that was the funniest joke ever. And every everything. time I must have told that for Gary for a hundred times, he said, Tell me airport story, tell me airport <laughs> story, tell me airport story. And, well, and I did, and he just he, he laughed just as hard the last time he did the first time. So, but anyway, well, Mr. Page, this has been a fun. Uh, season for Indy 500 yesteryear and today. Your final thoughts? Well, I probably have learned more this year than I was ever able to offer. It, uh, it, it, it's been a lot of fun. I've told a lot of good stories. And I've met a number of people that have been um, visiting us every week. Uh, the, the, they're just nice people. So I, this is a very positive thing for me. I'm glad to be part of it. Well, it's good. I, and I, I was told, don't ad lib this. So I have a script to conclude with. <laughs> I won't say who said don't ad lib it because that's, that's kind of me. But I'm in the business, you know. In September of 2019, a fellow former Ball State student 
and Howie Call, next door neighbor Robin Miller and I started discussing creating an Indy 500 nostalgic podcast called Miller Time. And we wanted to share the great memories of the Indy 500 that helped make the, it the greatest spectacle in racing. It was to debut in May of 2020, but COVID screwed it up. Uh, and then Robin's declining health uh, uh, put the, the premier on hold. Uh, with Robin's passing, several fans suggested I reach out to Paul Page to see if he would like to join the show to be dedicated to the memory of Robin Miller. And he eagerly accepted, which I thank you. Then Bob Gates, who continues the Robin's Racer Lunch at Charlie Brown's and Speedway ongoing, also joined the show. We named it Indy 500 yesteryear and today. We posted our first YouTube show on May 2nd. It was our intentions to have a special guest appear from time to time. We wish to express our real great gratitude for uh, Mark Dill and Mike Lashmuth and Poppy and director Nate Adams and Pastor Will Marathi for appearing. Uh, with the conclusion of the 2022 Indy 500 champ season, we wrap up this show as well. We want to thank all our viewers for watching, and we look forward with great anticipation to 2023 and the opening of the Speedway and see who's going to drink milk in victory lane. Robin, you know, we really miss you and eagerly look forward uh, to when you are inducted into the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame. And that's, uh, that's going to be one of my uh, uh, Don Quixote windmill type of things to get Robin in that along with you, Paul. And now, since this is a nostalgic show, I'm going to throw it to Paul Page to give his traditional IMS Radio Network sign-off. Well, remember, we're uh, only a few blocks from the great Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So, good morning, good afternoon, or good night, depending on where in the world you are. We are at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the world's greatest race course. Drive safe. Very good. Well, Merle, we can't thank you enough uh, for coming on the uh, in- on to be what would have been your dad's birthday, but uh, to have it at Charlie Brown's is real special. So for insiders, Paul Page, Speedway insiders, Paul Page, Bob Gates, this is Denny Miller saying Godspeed, and we'll see you next May.